We started out the last chapter solving AX equals B, which is a square linear system of equations. Then we moved on to overdetermined linear least squares problems where we minimize the residual. In this chapter, we've been solving systems of nonlinear equations that are square in the sense of having as many equations as variables. The last piece of the puzzle is to minimize a nonlinear function that has more components than the number of variables. This is the nonlinear least squares problem. Our setup is a nonlinear function f that maps from n dimensions to m dimensions, where m is greater than n. We still have a Jacobian matrix. It has the same definition as before, but now it's an M by N matrix with more rows than columns. The big picture remains exactly the same as in Newton's method. We build a linear model of F around the current point XK and then we solve that model to produce xk plus 1. The linear model also looks the same. Here we have a matrix AK that is m by n, and it might be the exact Jacobian, a finite difference approximation, a Broyden style approximation, or what have you. Now we have to ask what it means to solve this model. Since we're trying to minimize the original function f, it makes a lot of sense to minimize the norm of the linear model in its place. That's how we'll define xk plus 1. When we write out what this means, we're looking for a step SK that solves a linear least squares problem involving the Jacobian and the residual vector. This is known as the Gauss-Newton method. Put simply, it solves a sequence of linear least squares problems to produce points that we hope converge to the nonlinear minimizer. So this is our original code for using Newton's method to solve systems of equations. What's interesting is that the exact same code works for the Gauss-Newton method for nonlinear least squares. The reason is that most of these things are done without any reference to the sizes of things. This is our call to the user supplied function f. So the user has to provide code that does the right thing. So it should produce a y with m entries and a j that is m by n. But we don't need to know that in this code, we just need to know that the Jacobian is given to us. Um, the norm function doesn't care how long the vector is. So in this case, the x is n and the y is m, but that's OK. Maybe the most interesting thing is when we compute the step size or the step that we're attempting to take. When we did nonlinear systems of equations, j was square, and then this represented solving a linear system of equations. Now j has more rows than columns, and this represents solving a least squares problem. But the notation is the same because it's just minus j pseudo inverse times y. And then the update is the same, everything else remains the same. The convergence of Gauss Newton is a little complicated. It can be super linear for a while, but if the optimum residual norm that we're shooting for is not small, 
the convergence rate slows down to linear. The details are in more advanced books. One motivation for nonlinear least squares goes back once again to data fitting problems. Suppose we have m observation points given and we want to fit them to this function r where v and k are parameters to be determined. Now the values of this fitting function don't depend linearly on the parameters v and k. So we can't use linear least squares like we did before. We define a misfit function of the nonlinear parameters by taking the differences of the fitting function and the data values over all m points. So this defines a vector of misfits, and the goal is to minimize the norm of the misfit as a function of these two parameters v and k. So here's our nonlinear fitting problem. T is a vector of m points, and then y starts out as exactly this function, which is the same as our fitting function type. But I'm going to take that data and add some random noise to it. And so you see you get this oscillation around some kind of smooth curve. I've written this function misfit in another file, and the idea is that given parameters v and k, and the values of t and the values of y, so these are my data points, given all that, we define f as the difference between our fitting function. So within this function, we've been given parameters, we've been given values for the parameters v and k, so we can compute the fitting function, take the difference between the fitting function and the data. So that's the residual, that's the thing that we're trying to make equal to zero. The Jacobian of this, so it's easiest to think of it in terms of columns. You take the derivatives of all of these values with respect to v. Well, since v is in the numerator, you just get this. And if you take the derivative of all these values with respect to k, again, it's very simple computation, and you get this. So that defines the two, ver the two columns of our Jacobian matrix. Now, if I just pick the parameters randomly, so 1, 1, let's say, then the norm of this residual is about 0.56. Um, if I change this to a 2, then the residual gets smaller. Of course, we know that the best values are somewhere pretty close to the original 2 for v and 0.5 for k. That's how the problem's set up. But we're pretending like we don't know that. We're just going to solve for them automatically. So the way we do that is the um, Newton cis function expects a function of just one vector variable. So in this case, the vector is the vector of unknowns. That's v and k. So whatever x is, the first component should be v, and the second component should be k. And then the misfit function requires those two things, and then the vector of t's and the vector of y's. All right, so this is our initial guess. And then we just ask to solve it. So each column represents a different guess for the parameters, and they're headed off to uh, the correct values. Even after three iterations, they're pretty close to the 2 and the 0.5 that we would expect. Not exactly, but approximately. So the last column of that C, I'll call C final, that's the final estimate. V is the first component, K is the second component, and then I'll evaluate what the actual residual was at that point, 
So remember we were getting like 0.6 or 0.15 before. So here again, the best values are pretty close to the 2 and the 0.5, not exactly because of the randomness. And then the norm of the residual now is reduced to about 0.06. So finally then we can, based on the V and the K that we now know, we can create a function for the model that we can evaluate anywhere we like. And so if we plot that model on top of the data, then you can see we get this nice curve that clearly goes sort of splitting the data values.